I have to say that I think they're all excellent papers. Um, they're all very interesting. They all use novel methods and ask novel questions, and they come to some original conclusions. So I'm not going to be sort of critiquing them from the point of view of the basis of what they do, but I'm going to be thinking in some more general ways about the papers. And as you've seen, there are two on ethnicity and two on gender, and I shall treat them separately. So I shall start with the ethnicity. And I think there are three interesting issues, many others, but the three I want to comment on. One is, which groups do you choose when you're doing horizontal inequality analysis? Second, trends in horizontal inequality, what can one say? And third, something about politics. Um, so which should we choose? I mean, in the papers that we've got, the Indian paper chooses caste categories, but in actual fact, there's both the broad categories, as I understand it, and the refined categories. And there's a bit, I'm not sure I fully understand that, but a bit of a mixture, and I'm not sure one should mix up these two things. But in any case, that's what is chosen. And clearly, you could choose other things. Um, you could choose, for example, religion, or you could uh, group some of the ethnicities together. There are a lot of different ways of choosing groups. In Guatemala, basically makes also two choices, the broad indigeneity versus non-indigeneity, and then subdivisions of indigeneity. And again, you could have just gone with the subdivisions, or you could have found particular groups in the subdivisions which are closer together. For example, if, I don't know so much about Guatemala, but in Africa, it's very often that there are groups, but they're very similar, and other groups which are very different. So you could have chosen that. Within the uh, Ladino category, there are those people who would self-identify as mixed and others who would not. And then, of course, you can do self-identification, observer's identification, primary language identification. They all give you different results. I think the first thing to say is there's no right way of doing it, and we should recognize that. Someone said in their presentation, not sure I got the groups right. I don't think there is a right way. I think you have to think about what the reason is you choose particular groups. And what are the grounds for choice? Well, one is, and, and these grounds sort of overlap, but one is the sharpness of the boundaries. I mean, if they clearly, if you took um, Malaysia, there's a very sharp distinction between people who are Muslims and Malays and Chinese and Christian, and it's not, there's not much blurring and there's not much intermarriage but you go to some African country and you'll find there's a lot of intermarriage, a lot of people who are, and it's quite difficult to know where to take the line, where to draw a line. So how sharp is the distinction? And again, going back to what I was saying about Malaysia, if there are other categories which overlap in the sense that, say, in, uh, in Nigeria, you could take a religious difference, Christian, Muslim, or you could take ethnic, or you can do settlers indigen and in the middle belt, and they all work and they overlap. So they're very strong distinctions between people who have a lot of things in common as against others. Um, well, then you might also look at the salience of the choice for people. Uh, what do they think about themselves? You ask them perceptions of difference. And we did some work was quite interesting in uh, West Africa, in Ghana, and when you asked them what was their most important identity, they said religion. But then when you asked them what made them vote, it was ethnicity. So the things can be salient in different ways. They can, it might, you might think it's really important. It's also a question of what other people think. I mean, I know that it was what, once, a, once a group is categorized by others as the enemy group, that group become coalesces, as it did, for example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in Nazi Germany, in, you know, wherever. So quite often it's what other people think, and then that becomes the salient group. Then there's the issue of behavioral differences. There's a brilliant book by Blau about groups, and he actually defines the difference between groups as group, a group is a group if it has more interactions, social interactions within the group, than it does between. I, I guess it has to be quite a sharp difference. But that's quite an interesting way of categorizing, but you need a lot of information. Well, then there's political salience. I talked a little bit about the voting, but political salience really depends. I mean, people, political leaders are quite canny and they want to get support, which is going to um, get them voted into 
uh, government and so on. So if there are a lot of little groups, they'll mass them together and redefine them in such a way that they become one big group. And that's happened quite a lot in many places in the world. So what seemed to be a lot of groups suddenly becomes a single group. And it's interesting in the case of Guatemala that these individual groups haven't apparently coalesced in that way, in a way that would give them political power. But that's another way of, uh, and sometimes it's a question of money. I mean, there was some groups in, in um, I think it was, Malay, uh, I think it was Indonesia actually, who were trying to raise money. And it's, if you want to raise money for your group, it's it, good to appeal to American Pentecostals. So you might as well define yourself as a Pentecostal rather than defining yourself as some indigenous group in Indonesia, because the Americans are not going to be interested in you in that case. So there are lots of different reasons. Um, so the choice is obviously going to depend on the question you're trying to answer. So on public goods provision, you might be particularly interested in political mobilization and also in the perceptions of others because, you know, there's a theory about social psychologists have about the scope of justice and that people think that one should be fair, but only fair within certain defined groups. So your own group is, yes, we ought to be fair across these. We shouldn't let those people starve. We should give them public goods. But you don't have a scope of justice between the groups. I'm not totally convinced by that because we have done some uh, collected evidence in Africa where a lot of people support a cross-group redistribution. But there is that, and that's one of the explanations of why public goods are lower in fragmented societies that you don't want to give goods to other people, raise your taxes and give goods to other people. So that's another uh, reason why you would take a particular attitude. Um, on labor market outcomes, the relevant groupings were presumably, you know, the source of discrimination. And to discover that, you might have to do the sort of experimental research that we've just heard about for men and women, um, and so on. So basically, I think what's a very interesting question when you're starting work on this is to think, why are we choosing this group? Is it the right group? Why don't we try the same thing with different groups? Would we get different results? And, and so on. And of course, in some societies, there may not be so many potential categorizations than in others. Second question is trends in horizontal inequality. And there's very little data on this over time. So it's very interesting. And I think one does need these case studies to put it together. And for India, you found that there's been some increase in horizontal inequalities over the last 20 years. But in more recent years, different trends at the national and the district and state level, which is, again, interesting. Um, and now in Guatemala, you found decreasing horizontal inequalities, which was interesting to me because earlier work we did we found that it was decreasing on the social side, like education, but increasing on the economic side because of regional differentiation. But that might be because we chose the groups so that we used region as the basis. So it could be the way we chose the groups. Um, so the, the point to note really is that it, the trends are gonna be sensitive to choice of group. They're gonna be sensitive to the choice of measure you adopt. So if you take education and you're nearly at for like, you know, 100%, as you go on, you're obviously going to get equality. At the beginning, it's like a Kuznets curve. You're going to get widening inequality. So in, if you've taken tertiary education, you probably find widening inequality. But at primary education, you find declining. So it's, it's sensitive to the measure. Um, then any aggregate measure, and none of you actually used an aggregate measure, what I mean by aggregate measure is you take society and you aggregate all the groups together and see whether horizontal inequality is increasing or decreasing. And that may not be very useful because some groups may be decreasing and others increasing. And I was thinking of, say, the United States, where if you took uh, blacks versus others, you would probably find it staying about the same. But if you took Asians versus others, you'd find it it was closing up completely. Um, and finally, I was just going to say that I like the analysis of why, the, why there's a trend decrease in labor market outcomes in Guatemala, because there's much too little work in general on explaining change. Then coming to politics, and my original interest in horizontal inequality was and remains deeply political. That is, you know, why people go into conflict. Um, and then your work on public goods is obviously political too. On conflict, um, the, what the one question is, you know, how do horizontal inequalities lead to mobilization and tracing it? 
And what, what we find, uh, and you didn't really go into the political inequalities at all, but we find political inequalities very relevant. And I think the political inequalities are also relevant to the public goods issue because um, not only the quantity of public goods, but the distribution of public goods. So you're assuming that if you had more public goods, they would be distributed in such a way that horizontal inequality would decline. But there are many cases where if you have more public goods and one good dominates, I mean, that you can show that in Kenya, that's happened a lot of times, certainly happened in white South Africa. More public expenditure, fine, but actually horizontal inequalities worsen. Um, let me see. Yes, so I think that's really basically what I want to say about the, th the, 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 the ethnic groups um, papers. And I did find them extremely interesting and, and stimulating. Let me come to the gender papers. And they have some interesting things in common. First of all, they both find an adverse outcome, not very surprising. And they both try to explain the adverse outcome. Obviously, in education, in response to weather change, via meningitis in, in the case of Niger, and in wage gaps in general in the second case. Uh, in, um, no, I'm sorry, and in wage gaps in that, that case too. And in the second case, clearly, why men have different views on women. So. By the way, I found the second paper very interesting, and I'm going to tell my granddaughter it, because she was, I was just talking to her, and she's in a physics group in which everyone is boys except for her. And she said that they got different results from her, and she was absolutely inclined to think that hers must be wrong. And we were saying, why do you know that you've got all, why should yours be wrong, why not theirs? But, you know, I tell her the paper, and then she'll, then she'll believe that she's right. So Now, the second thing about the gender papers, which is so interesting, is that they both use very innovative methods to get at results. And I, I always like these sort of experiment using, using quasi-experiments or experiments, and you can find innovative results. So one paper uses a type of natural experiment, and the other one uses more uh, explicit experiments. Um, they both have innovative policy conclusions. Um, on, the, on the, um, the sexism sort of issue, um, did you ask, did you give the sexism questions to the, peop the respondents as well as to the advisors? Because I wonder if that would influence the extent to which they... Yes, do, why not? Well, so... Um, so the way the sexism questions happened was that um, we had a, a post-experiment um, survey in which we asked lots of things, and included in them were these 25 items on the sexism inventory. Now, um, this being my first experiment, I didn't realize that you know that could be a problem, uh, in the sense that the treatment itself could have affected the answers that you got on the on the um, on the on the sexism score. So what we've done is um, we've run some regressions. And those regressions are telling us uh, uh, that if we run the sexism uh, score on the treatment, it, it's telling us that there's no difference between the treatment, uh, uh, the control treatment, and the um, gender treatment. What we need to do is go back to the lab and add the uh, sexism inventory questions before uh, we make them do the experiment and to see if, uh, if, if that has an effect. But for now, our, our regressions are telling us that, that we are fine. But that is indeed a design flaw. So, but you did, you did make the, the subjects as well as the advisors take the questions. That's, uh, because the advisors are actually people who've done the, um, uh, the experiment. So they were subjects in, an ex in the same experiment. Yes. Okay. And then we took, took their answer. So they did exactly the same thing. Um, and the other thing, which is the sexism question seemed to me to be open to people not, uh, not answering them truthfully because they're obviously politically incorrect. But I don't know if they've allowed for that. Uh, so. That's quite right. Um, that's why I presented uh, our scores next to um, the other countries, which sort of shows that we are, you know, 
um, similar. So it seems that we are fine. The other thing is that the social psychologists have a measure of internal consistency. What they do is they switch the scales of certain questions, such that uh, some questions become uh, more sexist if you answer one, and some questions are more sexist if you answer five. And that is a, an attempt to you know, yeah. get at the internal consistency of the measure itself. And so we ran those tests, and they seem, uh, one of them is uh, the benevolent sexism test is borderline. It has a score of 0 0.7, which is sort of marginally acceptable. Uh, the other is 0 0.83, which is, you know, which is fairly acceptable. So that we're essentially taking from the social psychologists. They are telling us that here is a measure of uh, sexism. And, um, you know, we've um, um, uh, done, you know, like 2000 papers use this measure of sexism. So we're just taking their yeah. word for it, yeah. really. Fair enough. So both these papers have rather innovative uh, policy conclusions. The, um, the, the paper on uh, health suggests that, you, well, you should use um, health policy and education policy. Um, I was interested that you didn't suggest that you could use financial compensation as a policy mechanism. And I think that might be a more direct policy than uh, given that your theory is that the policy uh, that it's money that's the problem. Um, uh, your paper suggests that you need anonymity in promotions, which is absolutely right, but you also suggest talk of the need to reform attitudes. Well, that's a big, that's a big issue, and I think you need to explain what you mean by that, how you do it, and so on. And maybe the very fact that this sort of results are there should be widely disseminated and might change attitudes. So I think that might in itself be helpful. I felt that both the two papers made a bit of a leap between the findings, the strictly econometric findings, and the conclusions, in a sense. So the first one um, is a little bit speculative about the constraints leading to the reduced age of female marriage being the cause, though you do have evidence for it. I mean, you show that uh, there is an increase in that. And I felt it was probably right. But, and I felt when you gave the talk, you, you sort of enlightened me because you said, we both authors live there and we've talked to people and we know what happens. And that's what I felt was missing in the paper, a sort of anthropological dimension, which explores these things, which would then be more convincing when you went to test them. And then, you know, just reading it, I thought you were outsiders who came with this theory and hadn't, and it wasn't sort of grounded. And so I thought that was good and interesting, but you should put more of it in the paper. Um, then I felt your paper jumped from the attitudes issue to this being a cause of discrimination and wage gaps, which again is probably right, but of course there are many other reasons why there are wage gaps. Um, and so there's, well, there's sexism itself. There's all sorts of things like there's pregnancy among women, which might make employers rationally discriminate against them and so on. So you can't quite jump to the conclusion. So it's a little bit of a leap. And I felt there was maybe a bit of a leap in some of the ethnic papers into the final conclusion as opposed to the findings. Um, so in a sense, what I'm saying, and I, well, that's always good if you end research by saying you need more research, <laughs> is that uh, having come to these tentative conclusions, you say that it's more research. You see, on, on the climate change conclusion, I felt that that needed more explanation for me to be convinced that your findings were relevant to climate change. So you need to say in more specificity how that would be translated. Then, of course, both the papers and indeed the earlier papers raised the question of replicability, and that's always a question. Um, for example, in particular, on the uh, uh, bride price thing, you know, in Asia where you don't have a bride price, you have a diary, do we find that a health incident like that actually leads to um, the men marrying, you know, you, could, you can imagine, it would get the opposite conclusion. So it'd be quite interesting to re re try and re replicate it. And in cases, many cases where there's neither a bride place nor a diary, do we then have a zero uh, conclusion? So that would be interesting to try that. Um, and then your students, you, come, you know, your elite students from LUMS, can we jump from that to what happens everywhere in the world. I mean, that is a problem about experimental 
evidence. So much of it is based, a lot of it's based on students in Oxford. I, you know, you, they all make a lot of money through these experiments. And then all around the world, the policies have changed because of these student attitudes. So that, that is a problem about experiments. I don't know what one does it about it. But anyway, despite these thoughts that the papers rose in me, I thought they were great papers. <laughs>